Hello, my name is Carol May Whittick. Welcome to Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening Woman. Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. Who is the awakening woman? She's a woman who's seeking a greater possibility in her reality and looking for solutions. She knows being awakened is not a lofty ideal but a necessity. If she can transform herself, she can change the world. Her conversations will introduce you to talented women who will speak to your spirituality, sensuality and soul. They share their stories and explain how they are in service to the world. So let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. My guest on this week's episode of Her Conversations is Nikki Sutton. She's a meditation and spiritual guide, a writer, video maker, and a qualified past life regression therapist. She has two successful YouTube channels providing instruction and meditations, and also is preparing to launch her first book on Hay House UK. The title of the book is Consciousness Rising, Guiding You Through Spiritual Awakening and Beyond. During our conversation, we discuss different aspects of the spiritual journey from awakening the dark night of the soul and facing our shadows so as always i begin by asking my guests her is an acronym for higher energetic resonance when do you feel your most her if we're thinking in terms of frequency and vibration i'd feel my most her when i'm out in the sunshine soaking in the sun's rays the life-giving energy from the sun and in the countryside, so out in nature, in the natural energies, um, with my family. So all three of those together, that's when I feel most alive, most energetic, full of vital energies. Um, and being with my family, my husband and my kids, and just seeing them happy with smiley, happy faces, that just fills me with so much joy. So we like to go out and have, spend plenty of time in the sunshine like in the forest or just in the countryside. And yeah, that's when I feel most alive, I think, definitely. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for being on uh, this this week's episode of Her Conversations. And one thing that Thank I you. always like to, to find out about the guests that I invite on is just a little bit about what in their life was the catalyst for them moving into the work that they're doing now. So are you able to just share a little bit of your story? Yeah, sure. Well, for me, it was a spiritual awakening um, and having a spiritual awakening and not finding too much information and support regarding that. There was stuff out there, but not as much as there is now. And just moving forward, as I moved through my awakening, I decided I wanted to help others going through the same process. Um because it was a pretty dark time for me. Some people's awakenings go sort of quite smoothly. Others, it's very abrupt and dark and difficult. And there's a lot of uh, sort of purging that goes on and even the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to help others through that and also help people to become aware of the true energetic, infinite nature of the self and of reality. And since I was a kid, I've always sort of thought that, things aren't as they appear like I don't I don't feel that this reality is really solid there's something else behind it I always felt that life does go on and that death was a lie you know mm -hmm. and uh, just just bringing that into adulthood that became my sort of mission is to help people sort of see that but with with evidence as well like describing people's experiences my own experiences and and even you know some scientific research which has gone on into these subjects usually well it was back in the 70s and 80s mostly not so much now because it's all sort of been suppressed and it's all a bit taboo now but just help, helping to show people that they're not just the human being they see in the mirror they are that too but they're, they're more than that so um yeah, it was a significant event that, that led to my awakening, um, a triggering event. Uh, for, there's many routes into awakening, but for many it is a, a significant event. Uh, it was a, a move. I, I uh, broke up with my um, partner, the father of my kids, and moved uh, quite a distance away. Um, he still sees the kids and everything. Um, and... I had to get a place on my own. I didn't know anyone and just sort of had to cope. And the shock of that, and my, my 
uh, dad had passed away not long before as well. It was just a bit much for my psyche to take um, and really broke down. But I was still trying to, you know, take care of my kids and be a good mum, sort of almost hiding all this from them. They were they were happy and they adapted well, as, as kids often do. Um, but inside I was really breaking up, my, my ego breaking down. Um, and then I sort of thought about the things I used to enjoy when I was younger, um, sort of looking into spiritual bits and bobs here and there. Because um, when I was a kid, I bought a book by John Edward, The Psychic Medium, and that book gave me a lot of comfort. And I realised, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy. I, I think life does go on, you know. And I bought tarot cards when I was younger as well. So I always had that interest. So during my awakening, well, during the traumatic events, I thought, well, what what did I used to love what could give me a bit of comfort here so so I started looking into spiritual stuff proper and um and that's when the awakening began um and just spending every evening sort of until one in the morning two in the morning researching and uh, and learning and it was just information overload at times but that's quite a classic awakening it's going through the searching and seeking stage of those hard work um and eventually it all calmed down and then I assumed my role as what I do today fabulous no it's great I I I, lo- I always love to hear what it is that kind of brings people into into themselves and into their work and definitely I can um resonate with uh, just always questioning things as well I've, I've always I've always been questioning about death for for instance it's been like it doesn't make sense it never made sense mm. um and I I even remember as a child when I when I was um my father passed when I was four and I remember oh. standing over um over the grave and like you know kind of like doing what you do at funerals and like throwing in flowers and everything like that and yet part of it and seeing everyone upset and everything but it's still never just just not being a, you, you can't really articulate it and um trying to work out it I don't know it just never it never I never bought into it at that time and I could never articulate it mm-hmm. and just as the way that life went is over the years I experienced a lot of passing of friends at pivotal moments of of my life um almost like every five or six years something would happen and the more it happened the less inclined I was to believe that um that they were gone gone Hmm. no it, it, it if anything it felt like okay they're gone but I can but I can still recall them I can like take on their mannerisms we can it didn't seem like a complete loss but I couldn't put it into um words but yeah I I I understand that um always having that curiosity as well so I always had that underneath but I've um you know with you speaking about your awakening I um one of the things that I really feel that we're going through at this moment in time is an awakening on a mass level. Mm. And it's just seeing how people are individually uh, tapping into like their intuition, even if it is on the first instance in looking at um, events that are playing out and saying it doesn't feel right and actually trusting their gut and and going with that I mean do you find that you're getting more people contacting you and saying I'm feeling something happening maybe they're not going through the deepest dark night of the soul but in a, in an effect you know there is a dark night of the soul of some sorts anyway like a journey for the for us to make of leaving something and coming into a new space Mm-hmm. Well, there's always been, I mean, since 2014, I've been doing this, there's always been, seems like a steady flow of people awakening and they'll come on, say, my YouTube channel and and, and say, oh, I've been diving into all your videos, I'm just going through my awakening, um, it, it, you know, it's helped, it's helped me a lot and that there's a lot a lot of people that that come on and say that and they seem to be the ones that are just having their minds sort of blown wide open um i guess at the moment yeah there could be could be more um the thing is with events that are happening at the moment that kind of is the tip of the iceberg for them perhaps and it's not yet uh 
quite always leading them into the spiritual concepts yet because if people can get a, a little bit too involved with the the workings of what's going on in our system and potential uh, you know misleading information perhaps things like that um and then concentrate on the the truth side of it um in terms of the system and then then it usually leads them into to spiritual concepts after that Mm. But um, I, I do think there has been an increase recently, definitely, and not just on my um, social media or whatever I'm doing. But, you know, when you, you look out there, you see a lot more people questioning and even family members of mine who who are not um, uh, I don't I don't like to call people awakened or unawakened, <laughs> you know, but, but um unaware of certain things they're starting to question like hmm this doesn't seem right and then me and my husband will um bend their ear on certain things <laughs> um, and um yeah they're starting to um awaken a bit too so I'd say yeah more more people are it's a great catalyst at the moment because when they see that things aren't what they seem out there they ask well what else is not right what else mm-hmm. haven't I been told and often this ultimately leads people to exploring the, the nature of self and of reality because this you know for the system to function we don't want to realize we're infinite consciousness mm-hmm. um because that means we won't want to be um caged suppressed within a system which is so physical and material so what's happening now does tend to at least eventually lead people um to the spiritual energetic nature of things um which is you know for me the ultimate truth that needs to be known Mm. so yeah (laughs) and and it's does your partner work with you it's just like in, it's interesting to, to find out sometimes I, I speak to people who you know for which makes it trickier they don't have that support or understanding of their work so um hmm. does he does he work in the same field as you um well he yeah he does work with me he's he, we are very similar indeed um well he's sort of more um maybe emotional and, and creative um in certain ways um and i'm sort of slightly more logical sometimes where it's sort of a good balance but he see he found me through my youtube channel because oh really um, yeah. <laughs> um, he um he watched one of my videos and in that video i said oh um like follow my facebook page right um or friend me on on Facebook. So he did, and and then he sent me a few messages, and I was uh, single at the time, and uh, and then we got to chatting. But he was over in Switzerland, you see. So uh, we had some uh, dates in Switzerland um, mm. <laughs> when my kids were at the dad's house, um, and uh, and it just went from there. And then he moved over here. So um, he uh, he he's very much helping to support people through awakening as well. He's always, always talking to people online and people he meets around. It's amazing the people he meets. He just sort of magnetizes to him people who need to, to talk about these things. Cause as you say, many people don't have anyone to talk to. Mm. Um, and yeah, he, he does work um, with me to an extent. Sort of uh, creatively, we, ch- we chat about stuff and like the guided meditations I do and, um, he, he does have a, quite a big input yeah so indeed <laughs> no that's great I'm always curious anyway as well yeah, it's nice. like as um especially you know it's it's some some things that um many um friends and colleagues that I have within the spiritual community are single <laughs> and you know so it's always just yeah. trying to find that um that partner that will fit into the work as well that but, but will understand the work as opposed to just having a partner I think it just gets to a point where you need to have someone that has a certain understanding or it just feels yeah. better and easier to have someone that's able to understand and support what what it is that you're doing. Um, you know, one of the reasons actually as, as well, I want to bring out one of the reasons that I contacted you or felt drawn towards you is one of the videos that I saw that you put out that was about spiritual bypassing. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting to me because uh, I'd been having kind of experience and conversations around that at the time and also very surprised at how um and not even talking about external events but how practices were used to actually kind of 
kind of overcome certain things but by not even looking at them Mm. so you know doing like meditating your mind out so you're just like floating on a cloud and not really looking at the thing and just then spending uh, prolonged periods of time as long as you keep your practice up you'll be up there um to to then not even address that and and to an extent having those thoughts and and some teachings and some direction were alluding to the fact that if you had to delve into any shadowy part of yourself um that was not favorable that was not what they were about it was about elevating that looking at the shadow talking about the shadow dealing with the shadow was not the thing because we had tools to get ourselves away and out of that and it really clashed with me because at the time I was right in the middle of a a period of shadow you know so Mm. you know and then thinking that and and for for a minute I'm like I need to get out of this and and trying to just kind of like meditate and and you know sage it and all the things away um but it couldn't work because I was just so deeply in what I needed to be in to really experience what it was to really um, to be- then to work my way through it and and understand why those things had happened and also to then be able to work on forgiveness of myself and mm-hmm. and the the experiences that I'd had with other people that had created that so for me it was a natural benefit and it was a healing then to um to actually work through the shadow not the easiest of things to do but you know mm-hmm. um and then then when I saw other people going through things or or they, I could just then tell that there were wounds that they just didn't want to go near at all. And that really surprised me because it was, I thought this is what spirituality was about, was about really looking at our stuff, but then learning that there are people that just don't want to go there at all. I mean, what Mm. have been your experiences of Mm. that and how do you, help people through that or you know just like open up to them that there's nothing to be afraid of with the shadow it's useful for us to see that Mm -hmm. okay so in in avoiding these things they tend to continue to repeat on us Mm. (laughs) because it's a part of the subconscious mind which is crying out for healing negative well I don't like to say negative emotions unhelpful unpleasant emotions that come up they are signs from the subconscious that something needs attention. That's mm. our subconscious mind saying, hey, listen to me. So if we don't listen to those uh, shadows, those parts of us we're unaware of or unable to face, then they do tend to compound and grow. Um, just like if someone's going through a tough time, they want someone to listen to them. It's the same with your own subconscious mind. So in not dealing with the shadows, they remain there. There are many uh, spiritual practices ways of thought which sort of uh, practice you know transcending which I talk about as well a bit Mm -hmm. of detachment um, and we calm and and clear uh, the mind we instead of being lost and swept up in in thought all the time we see it for what it is and step outside of it uh, instead of identifying with our thoughts because we're not our thoughts so we step outside of that that's all well and good and that helps us to practice being calm and peaceful uh, day to day Um, It's a bit like, you know, consciousness training, mind training. We're training ourselves to be calm and peaceful every day and to just go with the flow and transcend these bits and bobs, all of that. Fantastic. But in your subconscious mind, oftentimes for many of us, there's a whole bag of stuff that needs Mm -hmm. to be looked at. And if we don't look at it, it stays there and it continues to bug us day to day. You can wake up in the morning just feeling really crappy, right? And there's a reason for that. There's something that needs healing. If you're not paying any attention to it, you're, you remain that way. You can mask it with certain things, you know, like affirmations are useful. They're great for a quick pick me up and you can train the subconscious mind through repetition to believe certain things, uh, you know, like I am love and things like that. But that sometimes they are like sticking classes on emotional wounds. So that's why I talk a lot about inner work is going in there, you know, and sometimes for many people, it's too painful to face. They don't want to admit these things about themselves. They don't want to face old memories and and wounds and ongoing circumstances from the past that have taught them who they are or who they're not and things about the world which make them uh, lack confidence or 
lack self-esteem, have poor self-image. They don't, they don't want to often always face those things that are painful. But mm. it, it's in revisiting these things carefully when you feel strong enough to do so. And, and performing techniques like soul retrieval, for example, um, I've guided meditation on that and I've put that in my um, book that I'm writing as well, a, a big part on that. Can you talk a little bit more about soul retrieval and, and how you work with that? Okay, then. So it's actually a, an ancient shamanic practice. Um, it's very, very old indeed. And um, it's it's about the energy sort of being splintered off from the self uh, during traumatic events or ongoing circumstances. It's like you leave bits of your energy here and there. Therefore, you don't feel quite whole and complete as you move forward through life. So we can go into a hypnosis visualization. So this happens when you're very relaxed, when your subconscious mind becomes dominant, when you're very relaxed. So then we go on a visualized journey, uh, following the emotion you experienced today as a trigger to find what it was. We go into that memory. And first of all, we understand the memory better because through uh, perceiving things differently, as th with our mind of today, our, we've changed a lot over time. So with our mind of today, we can perceive old events differently, like, well, actually, that wasn't my fault. Actually, that wasn't appropriate. They shouldn't have said or done that. But as a kid or, or in teenage years, we soak things up as is, sort of as face value, and oftentimes the blame is put on the self. So we go back and perceive things differently. We wish love to the self and we have forgiveness through understanding for others in the memory or we, we try to anyway. Understanding leads to forgiveness, understanding of other people's backstories and why they behave as they do. There's usually reasons why people behave as they do because they've had um, horrible histories often themselves or at least in part. And then the main thing is that we, we locate the energy that was lost and it may appear as like an energy fragment, wisps of energy, a cloud or ball of energy. And we transmute that into love and then reintegrate it with the self. And in a way, it's reconciling that whole memory, bringing closure on it, seeing it in, it in a new way and, and completing the self once again in in that way for that particular memory so so that's how it works and it's very powerful and oftentimes clients you know will have a bit of emotional release there and that in itself too is very healing very cathartic it shows that there was something there that needs healing if there's an emotional release there mm. um and yeah it's a very helpful technique indeed <laughs> where where does that originate from do you do you know Ancient the background of it um, numerous ancient shamanic cultures um, mm. and uh, indigenous peoples. Um, however, the technique I use today is not a, a, exactly the same. There's various different techniques. Um, but yeah, it's definitely an, an ancient practice. So good. So good. And <laughs> and for, you know, like we, we mentioned as well, you mentioned before as well, to feel that if you are going to go to you know um start to move towards dealing and looking and working on those inner wounds to approach it safely mm -hmm. how would somebody do that in a safe way if they wanted to begin this practice as an individual within themselves do you have some advice some, some pointers some direction Yep. Okay. So um, take it real easy because Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, you couldn't spend your whole lifetime um, healing and, and, and feeling better and, and augmenting your perceptions and, and getting to that place of self-actualization um, or it can happen quicker, but it must be taken slowly and taken real easy because when you perform something like soul retrieval, you need some time afterwards to integrate the process. The subconscious mind sort of files all these experiences and, and makes sense of them over time. You sleep on something, you make better sense of it, right? Mm. But if you uh, sleep on it numerous times and, and have more life experiences having had that bit of healing, it makes even more sense and even more sense. So... Take your time, take it easy, do it when you feel 
feel strong enough to do so. So leave leave several days in between any kind of um, inner work or even a week between any inner work practice. Um, and uh, yeah, and make sure there's, if you have others that you can talk to um, in between as well, who will listen to you, just listen about how you're feeling your emotions a little bit. That's helpful as well. So yeah, the really there there is no rush take it easy and give yourself time to integrate perfect i'm just looking at um your website <laughs> just uh, like one of your latest mm-hmm. videos as well again and you have um one that's uh, called healing from having toxic parents and one okay that it's very um we can talk about that as well but i'm also Let's talk about the parents first, and then maybe we can go to the the other part where my where my mind is. How does um, how does someone heal from that? Because obviously these are your primary gu- guardians in the world, and they're really setting you up for success or failure emotionally in those beginning years. And if you do the work on yourself, how? much of needing to have somebody else involved in your process is it is it something that you can do without having to have communication with them or do you get healed to the point where then you're able to meet with them and and be able to have a conversation with them if you feel that's something that you're necessary to do what do you think works in that instance Mm. It depends on your parents, really. And, and by the way, I, I don't usually like to use the word toxic. It was an answer to a question from a viewer because everyone's always searching for toxic parents. I wanted to to put that term out there. And then I point out in the video, you know, that um, people aren't, uh, they don't, usually they don't mean to be that way. It's due to their life histories that have caused them to sort of act in a, a toxic way, if you see what I mean. But um, yeah, so when it comes to being able to be with your parents then, so it depends on them. A lot of the healing you can do on your own because in a way you're having perceptual changes which allows you to deal with your parents better in adult life. Um, some parents, obviously, if it's very a difficult time, they're... Um, say abusive emotionally abusive to towards your excessively controlling it's sometimes a good idea to perhaps distance yourself a little bit especially while you're going through a lot and doing a lot of inner work other times you can be with them and over over time it gets better we do tend to feel quite triggered by our parents often um, if there's a lot of history there and but the, the triggering sort of reduces within us as we begin to perceive things differently with them, mm. as we begin to have understanding and forgiveness for them. So you might have a parent that, that say, uh, a bit offhand and neglectful and they work a lot and they don't have much time for you, but they may have had it, they may have had a, had a lot of programming themselves that those were the priorities in life, that, that the career success was the most important thing. Perhaps they were also ignored and neglected too and they're passing it on. Perhaps they just don't have the emotional tools to face life too well. And, you know, none of these things were acceptable when um, our parents failed to parent us too effectively. It's not acceptable, but oftentimes we can have understanding for why they are that way. Because if everyone was brought up in loving, supportive environments, then they would uh, pass on those similar uh, characteristics and traits to their uh, children children as well so we can have an understanding for their backstories and look at the clues as to why they are that way and areas that they need healing that they've never been able to address their own shadows that they're unaware of or unable to face and that's why they've passed on these uh, that's why their parenting has been as it is do you see what I mean mm-hmm. the second part of the question is like parenting obviously then is transferred to any authority figures that we then have to encounter or work with or live with or um uh communicate with over the course of our lives and in particular leadership you know people that will never meet but are in charge of us in some way um as 
people are kind of working out their individuality how do they you know look at where they have given their power away you know as a parent and expecting like transferring that parenting from their parents to their bosses or to their their kind of uh, prime ministers or presidents or things like that um where it's been very codependent and they've kind of gone along with something because I'm just feeling that there is right now what I'm personally noticing are people questioning a lot of what has been told to them yet not knowing where to go and not knowing how to separate and find that self um, within that and so so there's a, a, a level of codependency, codependency which isn't it's, it's never a, a, a great place to be in. And yet they're, they're wanting to pull away, but not knowing where to go. Is, is that clear for you? So you mean like going from having parental figures that instruct you and, and tell you what to do and guide you mm. and you give your authority to them. And then you mean as you grow up um, <clears throat> doing the same with bosses and, and politicians and other people who tell you what to do. Do you yeah. mean that like transferring parent? making them parental figures in a way yeah yeah and especially when you're when you're um finding out that they're not necessarily because we kind of expect a lot from our leaders we expect them to be clean to you know not have affairs or like you know problems with money or you know that human things um but then also when we find that they've actually led us astray in one way or another how do we kind of work on feet and healing that level of deception or disappointment in the people that are set in place or we've given our authority for them to be able to lead us in a way well it's not it's not giving your power away so much to these individuals because they are just human beings themselves after all and you know they may have you know you wonder how how they got the jobs in the first place oftentimes mm. um yeah, it's it's finding your true self in all of this and realizing your sovereignty as a unique, infinite being. I mean, there will always be leaders because we need leaders in in different areas, you know, because they have different areas of expect expertise. We we do need to look to people with certain expertise sometimes that we don't have, and we want to be able to to trust them. And most of the time, um, we can do, and then sometimes we can't and therefore there needs to be this uh, questioning and I always question authority anyway um, just to make sure because if they have so much responsibility and what they say goes then we need to be sure that they are doing it for um, with the best intentions and for the highest good so I mean at the moment it's <laughs> pretty difficult to question authority and there's a bit of an attitude that if you do so then you're being a bit dangerous you know uh, sometimes but that mustn't become that way because we should they work for us at the end of the day we need to be able to to question all the way along what they're doing uh because they have a lot of responsibility and what they do has huge implications so we must retain uh, the right to have freedom of speech to question to discuss um, and in that way we're retaining some of our sovereignty mm. yep <laughs> no beautiful no it's just it, it just it's always something that I I I kind of want to wonder um how much of the transference is unhealthily done and then that disappointment when we when we just you know fight, even on on a on a simple thing when we just um, like for instance the amount of energy and adoration and investment that we have often put into people who are entertaining us more so mm. than leading us in any way, uh, and then the amount that we we invest so much into them their their marriages their uh, their merchandise and then you know when things start to turn a different way how it impacts us so so heavily and um you know it's like I suppose it's coming like you're saying from finding that self-sovereignty and taking away um 
our connection or our dependence on these people to lead us in any way, shape or form or tell us what to wear or buy or how to think. And this is just on a celebrity level as well, not even mm-hmm. um, on, a, on someone who's been elected as a leader. However, there is a level of election of, of leadership within the celebrity community any, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'm... I think especially what I've noticed has been interested and, and has been a slight pullback, um, maybe it's not full and total as yet, has been because everybody has been pretty much in the same position. So it doesn't matter if you make like a hundred million pounds a year or you're, you know, you've just got laid off from your job, you can't go out the house. Mm-hmm. And what that has done in actually bringing us all back to our own environment where so much of who we are is based on the response of the external Mm -hmm. particularly if you have a big following so I mean if you if you are a regular person then it will be the people that you know in your community the people you know at work maybe the people that you kind of meet at your gym and stuff like that um, and that kind of like will validate, especially if you don't have any particular um, personal practice and you've not got in contact with that self. But then to see how the, the effect that it has had on people who need tens of thousands of yeses to bolster them and seeing how the effect that it's had on some of the the ones that have chosen to continue to broadcast on social media because it's what it's what it's shown to me what it's shown to me is how 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 dependent they are on that external validation Mm -hmm. and what that external the lack of that external validation um has done in real time obviously they can get it to an extent through the the screens that they're that everyone's having to use to connect outside of their environment Um, Do you ever, I mean, have you ever worked with anybody who's had to kind of move, had like public adoration and then had to deal with what that meant if that's taken away or really finding out who they are and separating from that? I don't think I've worked with anyone like that this year, no. But um, I think we, (laughs) the nature of social media, it's, if, if everyone's looking at someone and following them and talking about them, then other people behave like, well, if they're so interested in them, maybe there's something that is interesting about them. Therefore, I'm interested in them too. Mm. Um, and many people want to be like them. And it's rather a distraction. And, you know, when you, when you receive likes, it, it uh, releases chemicals in the brain which which make you feel good and then those who don't get so many likes and they don't feel good and so it, it's it's pretty uh, pretty skewed there in society it can make people feel horrible it can make people feel great but it's a very short-term feeling of of greatness and happiness um it it's a terrible addictive distraction some people have really risen to the occasion of being uh less done you know like the makeup the hair the you know they've mm, and and good. and and seeing and seeing that um has been really interesting because it's it's starting to really reveal a real person and a real connection and you kind mm. of like appreciate them more that's what people want to see they want to see the realness oftentimes more um than the presented persona um oftentimes in videos i make where i'm just getting really real with something so talking about a particular topic you know informative instead i'm giving my opinions about it um offering my opinions anyway humbly <laughs> if anyone wants to listen or not um they tend to get more views because people appreciate the realness um, and it's nice to see people um, being that way rather than presenting a, a, a version of themselves which is often quite tinkered with and, and changed like in Photoshop or whatever and then other people are aspiring to be that way and it's sort of unrealistic. So I think that that's pretty good when they present a more realistic version of themselves, definitely. Mm. One thing I wanted to ask you as well, with regards particularly to YouTube, is how have you found that platform has worked for you with your work in, in you know, the, the way that you connect and, and build an audience? Um, why did you choose to do YouTube videos in the first place? 
Well, that's been the best way for me, actually. I In the beginning, I, I w- didn't want to put my face out there because I am rather an introvert, actually, and, and I, I didn't really want to... I want to do it at all, but um, I was writing articles for my website and I it was taking a, a good while for any traffic to mount up, as is often the way. Mm. I thought, well, I want to help people. You know, it was YouTube that helped me quite a bit um, during my awakening, the, the videos that were there. And I thought, well, if I can get on there, then... Um, if people have questions about awakening, they can see that someone else has gone through it and their experience. And there's others, um, other YouTubers um, now providing great service for, for many people now. So um, I thought, well, it, it would help more people out and answer more of their questions if if I could um, get onto YouTube. So I at first I was reading the articles I'd written, I'd put them on because I had no confidence. I'd never done it before. And I, 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 I put the articles um, on the screen by the camera and I was reading them out so you could see my eyes sort of moving backwards and forwards. And then I thought, I, and I put those videos out, they're still up actually. Um, and I thought, oh no, no, that doesn't, that looks a bit um, forced. So then I tried speaking just you know free free speaking and and that turned out okay and and the more positive feedback I had there we are it's boosting my self-confidence um the more uh, positive feedback I had the more I realized that what I was saying was valid and useful and helpful and was appreciated and I was very appreciative of, of the viewers and just grateful and humble that they would watch um and yes yeah, so it 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 just sort of grew gradually. It's, it's always sort of slow at first, but then it, it grew quicker and quicker. And with that, my confidence grew. So there's me mm. slating social media earlier. It did help me because I think as a kid, I never really felt like, I've got to be careful what I say, but um, I never really felt like my opinion was worth too much. So um, moving forward, with YouTube, it helped me to realize that actually I have something valid to say. Wow, revelation here. <laughs> so so um, it did help me a lot in, in that way and addressed, it was a bit like inner work. See, inner work can be done consciously day to day through just um, doing stuff, trying stuff, trying stuff outside the box. You don't always have to dive deep into memories. That's a very important part of it. But just pushing yourself a little bit sometimes, especially with confidence and self-esteem, self-worth, that can really help because through repetition you see oh I did it well I did it well again and again Mm -hmm. and then that that helps you obviously so so yeah YouTube was was the best one um and uh, I'm on other social media platforms too I've got a surprising amount of Tumblr followers actually (laughs) it always surprises me Um, I I (laughs) sure is wow okay cool I've, I've like abandoned it years ago. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, no, they're still there. Um, and then more recently, I went on Instagram, so that that's growing as well. But um, YouTube recently has um, been, you know, removing videos. So mm. I've been. I now mirror my YouTube channel on lbry.tv library where that's for content freedom and uh, it, it's a great platform and I now browse there instead of on YouTube most of the time because I can f- it's like the old days of YouTube where you can find what you want and you get recommended new stuff um, to watch because YouTube tends to sort of recommend you more plasticky stuff now or stuff bringing you back towards the mainstream but LBRY, it uh, it recommends you like brand new information, and it's quite it's quite interesting. I'll go on there in the morning and have a browse through and and um, and see stuff that's actually interesting. Um, so my stuff is is on there, and you can also earn cryptocurrency as well as you watch and browse oh, and share. Okay. So um, yeah, it's a good good place to be. That one freedom oh, of speech. <laughs> no, because uh, well, this is it because there there is so much. I I know about DTube, and I was telling somebody about DTube, and that's based on that's based on a um, crypto as well. Um, yeah. But but lbry i haven't i'm gonna have a look at that because they 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 we were looking at certain things because apart from this um this podcast like i mentioned to you before i do um work on another one where where we kind of talk a little bit deeper and wider about 
truth and and all of the movements and of of course we're going through a time where people are just being pulled down and demonetized and erased and and mm. their platforms are being that they've spent years and years building up mm. um a, a just overnight folding um and and for some they've got enough of a following and you know they've kind of backed themselves up on you know other either other social media platforms or they have a mailing list and they've got somewhere else to kind of direct their audience too but then they I think for, for anyone who is not really talking about current events they're still pretty much safe for the time being anyway one of the things that may happen who knows I don't know how this works but with the amount of suppression that's gone on in terms of people just voicing their opinion mm. and bring an alternative for people to look at and then actually use their own critical thinking to discern what feels true to them you know just kind of like going around and just like banging banging heads and pulling people down don't I'm not sure of the legality of it and also you know who knows as a result of that how long the trust in those platforms will be or people will know like okay this is the biggest one that exists at the moment but we know that you know we've we at the moment we're got to kind of play within the lines which isn't really fair mm. especially if an alternative opinion is outside of the lines of thinking or thought or or where we're all being directed to mm. so mm -hmm. um it's just good to know with the platforms yeah i found um is it bit shoot is that the one yeah uh, yeah that one um i didn't find too much on there that was sort of spiritually orientated so um i chose to go on library instead it just has a really nice sort of atmosphere over there and a good range of different kinds of content um it's just like a happier atmosphere i find if, mm. if possible on a on a platform on the internet <laughs> yeah yeah i'll have a mix around actually because i'm always trying to see where things are as well because you know but i used to have a myspace page so they're oh, rip yeah. <laughs> in myspace oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's another so yeah that's why i was surprised about tumblr but no great thank you for saying that <laughs> um <laughs> so i just want to um ask you the the her conversations uh, mm. questions that i ask all the women that, that come on and the first question is what is the best piece of advice a woman has ever given to you um okay so i uh, yeah that's a there's quite a, a few pieces of advice i think but one that really stands out is uh when i was a kid i i, I was at school and i was kind of moaning that i wanted to go home and and um you know, just moaning in general a teacher said to me and for some reason it just really hit me as really good sense a female teacher said to me that you, you shouldn't wish your life away you know mm. And I was like, oh, I should, yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and and the, the con, that's when the concept of sort of the present moment hit me. Um, I think I was only about 10 or something. I thought, actually, you know, I'm missing out on this present moment here. I'm missing out on having some fun um, uh, with my friends or, you know, I'm wasting the now. I shouldn't wish my life away, that's it. And, and having gratitude actually for what's happening right now or finding positivities in it if that's, if that's possible, making the most of things. And in wishing your life away, you're always in this state of wanting and not having, so you're not really manifesting all the best anyway. Mm -hmm. So, and I took that with me throughout life and sort of pondered on it. Uh, the, um, there's no, there's no uh, purpose in, in constantly having your head in the future looking to far horizons to make you happy and then as soon as you reach that far horizon a new one usually presents itself anyway and happiness is over there again so yeah I decided I'm not gonna wish my life away. I'm just gonna do what I um I'll do what I need to do aim for my dreams but I'm gonna live in the now instead so that I don't look back on my life and see that I've just been in my head all the time and I can't remember any decent memories I don't want to be walking around in my head all the time I'm gonna I'm gonna be in the present moment so that was a good piece of advice that, that teacher gave me I don't think she realized that that changed my psyche in in such a way I don't think she knew that happened 
that's perfect as well and a mini awakening for you at such an yeah. age to go like oh let's yeah. be in the now it usually takes people <laughs> like you know 30 or 40 years to work that one out so that saved you some time yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's far out. yeah. <laughs> and um who is who would you say is a woman that represents higher energetic resonance to you um okay so well first first of all I have to say um my well my grandmother of course <laughs> mm. first of all because she was just so lovely and she's not around anymore I really miss her I'd love to just have a cup of tea with her nowadays and just chat with her she was just so calm and collected fair and, and sweet and caring and just nurturing and mothering and she and she did charity work as well she worked for the red cross she's always out in the garden doing nice um growing nice veg and and flowers and things and she she's just everything that i inspire aspire to be um and if i say another one it, it another lady it might be amma the hugging saint have you heard of her um uh-huh. yeah she's a um indian hindu spiritual teacher um and she also mainly she has a lot of charitable organizations all over the world for like housing and um, medical assistance food and education that that's you know that's the main part of her work I think but you know she does events where she hugs you know a thousand people at once and she's hugged apparently like 33 million people Mm. and you know to invite someone into your personal space that you don't know you know, that's a special thing. To give them a hug, it means a lot. But to invite 33 million people into your personal space, hugging her is like hugging 33 million people because mm. the energy stays with her. And it's a special thing. Sometimes people just need a hug and some people can't get a hug. Um, and I think it's beautiful. And, you know, it's free to go and give her a hug. I think it's I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing. And all the other work she does, I think she is a saint, you know. That's fabulous. And so- so pertinent right now where you know so many yeah. people are just like crying out to have that contact to remember how how important just a simple just a simple movement like that to do is the world is missing a lot of that right now so yeah it's a bit difficult at the moment is not yeah it? So, yeah soon and very soon we'll we'll get that back yes yeah, so she represents a lot <laughs> yeah yeah it's good to good to good to know and I, I hope you know, I can imagine that she, she, more and more people will just want to be in her presence and hug. And yeah, wow. my husband he got a hug off her actually in Switzerland, and he said it was it was wonderful. The atmosphere there was amazing, mm. and afterwards he helped out and um, washing some pots and pans and things as well. Um, <laughs> but he said it was just fantastic. It felt amazing. It was really lovely to be there. So beautiful, lucky <laughs> him. Yeah. And and what's your favourite self care ritual and practice? Hmm. Okay. So it's kind of a three in one, you know, and it's pretty simple. Um, so in my garden, we have a, a small lawn and my husband planted a load of daisies in um, a daisy circle. Hmm. So they're quite big daisies, actually. And what it's meant to create is like a sort of an energy vortex in there. So you go sit. It's interesting. The local cats all come along. And they sit in the middle of the daisy circle. So we often have these cats just sitting, like <laughs> random cats and our cats sitting in the daisy circle. So when the cats aren't there, I'll sit in the daisy circle. And again, with the sunshine. So I'm enjoying the sun, soaking up the sun's rays, meditating in the middle of the daisy circle. Plus I'm grounding as well. So I'll make sure I've got bare feet. So like as I'm sitting cross-legged, the sides of my feet touching the ground maybe I'll put my hands on the ground because that's important grounding you you um you release your built-up sort of static electricity in your body it goes into the ground and and through the ground we receive negative ions um negatively charged ions don't be fooled by the word negative they're a good thing Mm -hmm. and they come into your body and they mop up the free radicals within your body they're the ones that cause damage they're the positive ions so you're rebalancing your sort of energetic charge and this is actually proven scientifically although not put out there very much of course because it's free to do Mm. and you can't charge for it or patent it um so you can 
sit and do your grounding. It's great for reducing inflammation, connecting with the earth, and it, it's proven to help reduce inflammation and, and reset your body. So getting the sunshine, grounding in the middle of the daisy circle, um, in the little bit of nature we got out there and meditating as well. So I'll usually do a mindfulness meditation where I'm observing non-judgmentally sort of sounds that I can hear, sort of kids playing in other gardens or someone mowing in the distance or the birds tweeting because we've got a decent, decently sized tree there. It's absolutely beautiful. The birds, they've got some bird feeders out. So I'll listen to them tweeting and flying about and the bees. And just being mindful of, of those things, bringing my attention to those things, how I feel, the, the gentle breeze, and experiencing that entirely in the present moment and free of thought for the most part. I see my thoughts come and go. And in that moment, it's just bliss. Absolutely wonderful. So that's what I like to do. <laughs> that sounds magical. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Do you know, I'm just thinking I haven't seen a daisy for ages. Oh, oh. you can buy a packet of seeds. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so oh. much, Nikki. And um, can you just let anyone let everyone know if you've got anything coming up? What's next on the books for you? Aha, uh-huh. when well, you say on the books, well, I'm writing a book. So I'm really privileged and honoured to have been approached by Hay House, Hay House UK. And um, they'd seen my work out there. So I went for a meeting in London with amazing women, uh, five women and uh, um, really empowering, inspiring ladies. And they they liked my work. And we discussed um, some book proposals that I put forward that they asked me to do. And uh, it was lovely there. Really nice to meet them. And Michelle and Joe, really, really amazing women. And so I have been writing this book and I've nearly finished. So I've got some more editing to do on it. So I've got to hand it in soon. And then it's sort of slated for release, I think, March of next year, because it's got to be translated into a bunch of languages, I believe, mm-hmm. um, working on the cover art and things at the moment. So um, that'll be out next year and I'll be doing some other bits for them as well I believe some guided meditations and things as well so I'm really just absolutely over the moon to be doing that um and they're a really really cool company um because they they put out there all that stuff um that people need for their spiritual growth and evolution so I'm happy to be part of that so what's your book called Nikki it's called Consciousness Rising, Guiding You Through Spiritual Awakening and Beyond. So it's to sort of help people through the awakening process if they need it, just so that they feel like, you know, they're not alone and that others have gone through it too. So there's lots of examples in there of people's experiences as well as my own. And there's, uh, you know, quite a, quite a lot to learn in there, stuff if you, you don't know already. And then it guides you through beyond the process as well so it gives you tools to help you move forward on your spiritual path as well and then I'm continuing to make uh, my videos on both channels so the videos where I sit and and answer people's questions and talk and then my channel guided meditations with Nikki Sutton where I put out uh, guided meditations there to help people with meditation so I've got two YouTube channels spiritual awakening and guided meditations with Nikki Sutton Perfect. And what else? I've got some, my courses. I'll probably make another course at some point as well, online course on nikkisutton.com. Great. And um, you've, you've said your YouTube channels and your website and on social media, where are you? Well, if you just search for Nikki Sutton, so I'm on, I'm on all of them really, I suppose. I'm on um, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest as well. Tumblr, as I said. <laughs> and... Um, what else I'm on minds as well but um yeah so just just have a search and uh, I think I'll probably pop up if you're interested so perfect that's great Nikki I just want to say thank you for giving me the time today to speak to you and just find out about the work that you're doing and what you've got coming up and um I really appreciate it it's been great just learning more about you and who you are well, thank you too. I, I love your podcast. It's really empowering, especially, you know, uh, for women, 
focusing on on women which you know is is wonderful and i think you're you're great you are i think you're fantastic i have to oh. say and a breath of fresh air and lovely to speak to thank you thank you to nikki for joining me this week on her conversations and thank you for listening you can find out more about me on my website, which is carolmaywittick.com, C-A-R-O-L-M-A-E-W-H-I-T-T-I-C-K.com. And you can find me on Facebook under the same name and also on Twitter and Instagram under Kazmik, that's C-A-Z-M-I-C-K. Thank you so much for listening once again. Until the next week, have a good one. Take care. Bye.